Hello, this is Taya Graham, and welcome to this live stream special edition of the Police Accountability Report. I want you to know that this is a very live recording, so please be patient with us and forgive <laughs> us for any technical difficulties or little stumbles that might occur along the way. So just to let you know what to expect this evening, first, Stephen and I will hold a short discussion. Then we will introduce our special guest, a cop watcher who was just released from incarceration, who helped win the right to record in the second highest court in the land. And afterwards, we will engage with your questions and comments, the ones you left me on the recent community posts and the questions or comments that you put in the chat tonight. Now, as you know, on this show, we cover the grassroots movement known as cop watching. As you already know, it is a diverse and expansive form of activism that involves citizen journalists using cell phone cameras and YouTube channels to record cops throughout the country. It is also work that has garnered a huge audience on YouTube and, of course, has generated plenty of controversy. But today's show is going to look at cop watching through a different lens. We are going to be joined by a member of the community who has in part turned the criticism of cop watching on its head. And he has done so in a way that shows exactly why the people who take part in keeping their eyes on police can often achieve meaningful results that the mainstream media quite often chooses to ignore. But before I talk about our special guest, I want to introduce Stephen Janis, my co-host, to have a discussion about cop watching in general, what it is versus how it's portrayed, and perhaps what we will be focusing on today to give people a different perspective on it altogether. So, Stephen, how are you? I see you made your ways indoors again. Right. Well, you know, I really like reporting from indoors. It gets a little tiring always being kicked outside and having to deal with people <laughs> like yelling at me while I'm trying to report my family. So I really appreciate the fact that you've let me inside again. And maybe that's why I keep asking mm -hmm. us to do live streams. I think that is my push for the live stream so that you can come inside. But just remember, after this live stream is over, it's back outside for you. <laughs> uh, Seriously, can't I just spend a little time? It's very hot, you know. I mean, it's nice. You know having what? Actually, you know what? I just realized I gave you incentive to keep talking. So, <laughs> no, I'm not. Right. Absolutely okay. not. You go right back outdoors. Okay. Okay. So, why don't we prepared. get started? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Why don't we get started on our yep. conversation? So okay. what I want to talk to you about first was the idea of cop watching and what you've learned by covering it. I know you've done just an incredible amount of work on police accountability reporting, but you and I have been having a discussion about why cop watching is often misinterpreted. And I was right. wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Well, I think in the in the media, the people who do media or, or you know, grow up as reporters, let's say, or train as reporters, mm -hmm. want to think of our process as being very neat and tidy and, you know, organized and full of all sorts of, you know, traditions and rules or whatever. And, and that's partly true. But I think that sometimes when you're really struggling against a corrupt institution like policing, which policing is highly problematic, as we know, um, sometimes the process has to be a little more flexible, creative and organic. And I think that's what people miss about cop watching. And that's what I've noticed as a reporter. When I was reporting about, you know, police corruption back in, you know, 2007, 2006, 2008, whatever, you know, it was a very chaotic process. You were constantly getting tips. You were constantly thinking of new ways to tell the story because no one was really listening and no one was paying attention. And so you had to kind of create a different way of reporting and storytelling and different ways of approaching you know, the idea of journalism to 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 make it work because you really were in sort of isolation um, as a reporter. And what I see in cop watching is the same organic kind of sensibility in the sense that cop watching is a response to the insanity that we have a society where, for example, you know, police, as we showed in a story just last week or earlier this week, still use prone restraint on people and people still die and no one does anything. And, you know, as we learned, as we learned, you know, the training, even though they said North Carolina said this, I'm sorry, its name was Christopher Hensley. He was he was in a prone position. Uh, police sat him for at least four and a half minutes. He died. It's very similar to George Floyd. So when you have a situation like that where police keep making these mistakes and nothing changes, I think the, the way you respond to it has to be creative and changing in a way to bring attention to it so people can understand it. It has to be organic and it has to be flexible and creative. Now, cop watching is extremely chaotic in many ways. Everyone has a different style. Everyone has a different approach. I think that's actually apt for what we're dealing with, which is a very chaotic, chaos infusing kind of policing that causes many problems in a society that doesn't fix the basic problems for its people. So I, I think cop watching in a way is, is, is what you would expect 
when you're dealing with something like policing tail. I think that's a really good point. And something I wanted to talk about was how there's so many different styles of cop watching. I mean, right. I think there's many different styles of cop watching as there are cop watchers. Now there's some right. who use profanity to assert their first amendment rights. Uh, Monkey yeah. 83 and uh, Eric Brandt come to mind. Uh, some use comedy or even music like out of the watchdog. So right. I was thinking that cop watching can also be performative, almost like an art form. What do you think about yeah. that hypothesis? Well, you know, I mean, there is a great tradition in American popular culture, or let's say American subcultures, that, you know, when a, a pe when people are trying to find a voice um, from sort of an organic grassroots perspective, when no one will listen, they invent a way for to be heard. And, you know, we had talked about this day, and you're going to talk about it on our next show, you know, how the origins of hip hop, how the South Bronx, where hip hop was created, um, was basically abandoned. Um, you know, all federal funding had been withdrawn. It, it was a, a very poor and isolated community. And the young people in that community invented an art form that now the world, you know, literally dominates the world conversation. And really what it was initially was, well, part of it was like, just have a good time at a party. But the other part of it was, the, uh, a way to be heard, a way to hear the marginalized, the people who are not paid attention to, you know, and I think it's very appropriate, for example, that, that cop watching lives on YouTube, which is a, in a way we're, we're all like YouTube has been around forever, but it has not. It is relatively a new technology in some sense, a new a new form forum for people. So I think cop watching has taken you know, the, the technology of YouTube that makes it democratizes the ability to have a platform and to communicate and then taking the problem of policing, which is highly problematic and not responsive to what you would say the normal type of accountability and created sort of a solution. Yeah, it's chaotic. It's disturbing. I know there are times when you and I watch videos, right, Taya? And you go like, whoa, um, I, you know, there's, there, it makes you uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable sometimes, right? I mean, the times it makes you uncomfortable. Stephen, yeah. you are absolutely right. And I apologize. I had a little technical glitch there while you were oh, talking. Okay. So like I said, folks, this is live. I apologize. That was a technical glitch on my end. Um, you know, you were talking about how like hip hop is an art form. You know, sure. I was also thinking of and, and you had mentioned this too that uh, the movement of punk rock music, you know, it yeah. came from working class angst. It yep. showed the anger of a group of people that didn't feel like their voices were being heard, that right. didn't feel like that they, they were able to have any sort of influence on the way they were governed. And so I feel like that sort of that energy, that angst, that righteous anger comes through in hip hop, comes through in cop watching, um, and comes through in punk rock i don't know maybe i'm going too far but i see some remember, similarities there remember remember that punk music was in a way a response to the sort of the overly like bureaucratic corporate rock gods and suddenly you know you had yeah you had like and punk was sort of angered and energetic kind of response where you know people would pick up guitars and play chords backwards or any way they wanted like the ramones you know three chord song we're not going to do the opus we're going to make music that response to the angst like you said and the energy of the people and you know i don't want to get too far into this sort of analogy or metaphor but 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 cop watching is is so creative and there are just really no rules but it also fuels a lot of the uh, anger and you know if you think about like tom zebra who was like one of the first people that do actually probably was well we there's a lot of debate at first but he had to be one of the first he was doing it before youtube and and he was just so outraged about the behavior of police in Los Angeles that he just decided every night. And we saw that when we spent some time with him that he was out every night. It wasn't just, you know, I'm gonna go out and get some clicks. It was like, hey, I'm gonna be out there every night watching police. And that is a totally different type of sort of accountability than what you see in regular journalism where we go from story to press conference to story to press conference. You have constant, you know, sort of, we're watching you. You don't know where you're gonna be watching us. You don't know if we're gonna show up. And, you know, one of the things we're going to be talking to Abity or Liberty Freak and Eric Brandt, they were out there like every night. Just it was it was interesting to me as a reporter to see because I, to me, I always go to where there's a story, right, where something big is happening. But these guys would go out and just they see cops somewhere and they just start filming them. I'm like, well, why are you filming them? There's nothing happening. But that was part of their process. Right. Even a, a very you know unremarkable event. It was it was like we're going to go out there and shoot them and, and I'm sorry, film them. Excuse me. We use the word shoot and video. And um, I, I just was astounded because to me as a reporter, I'm like, why are you wasting your time out here? There's nothing happening. And yet they were very methodical and sort of going around Denver looking for a place to film. And 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 they would do it. It was just really, really 
uh, interesting and contrary to what a normal journalist would do. But I think that's what makes it somewhat more effective in some ways, right? Because a cop never knows if uh, Liberty Freak or Monkey 83 or Eric Brandt or Tom Zebra or Laura Shark, for example, are going to show up. They're just going to be there um, when you least expect it. And to a certain extent, I, I guess it's kind of like, you know, what they used to do with internal affairs in, in, in Baltimore City. They would set up stings and stuff and they would you wouldn't know internal affairs was testing your integrity. Um, it was a way to actually test your integrity. And, and in terms of integrity, um, you kind of predict how journalists behave. We show up when there's a bright light like moths to a flame. But cop watchers, well, they, they could be there any minute and you just... You don't know what to expect. And in a way, that sort of reflects the chaos that police sow in many communities like ours, like Baltimore. And what they have created is to have it's much more responsive, much more creative and much more flexible than we as journalists can be, which sometimes we tend to be a little bureaucratic and sort of, you know, how we are. You know, we think yeah, we're important. I really do. <laughs> we think we're, you know, saving the world and, and everything we put. But, but I think there's a little more humility and connection mm -hmm watching to the voiceless that sometimes we miss in the mainstream yes. media. That's why I respect and admire it. And I, I understand it sometimes is very problematic, but certainly we're in a country where there's so much voicelessness. Um, yes. So many people, I mean, I think social media is heightened the fact where fewer and fewer people have bigger and bigger attention of audience. And, and what, what you don't understand is that really what's interesting is that if you look at the channels like lackluster or Batusai, um, or any of the ones we mentioned, you know, millions of people are watching these guys and women um, every every week. And um, you can't ignore that. You shouldn't ignore. It. I know the mainstream media likes to just run a piece every couple of months about the menace of cop watchers. But that um, you can't ignore an audience like that. Why are people watching? We should be asking questions as journalists. Why are more people watching cop watchers? Than watching our journalism, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not talking about our show, but but certainly that's something that that should be asked, and I'm, I'm, it's something we discuss quite often, right, Taya? Absolutely. You know, I think it's interesting because you sort of point out how cop watching isn't neat and tidy. You mentioned how it, in, in journalism it can be kind of bureaucratic in the way that information travels and the way information is vetted and in the way information is curated and produced. But cop watching, you know, can be chaotic. And that's kind of what makes it creative. That's what makes it beautiful. That's what makes it unexpected. And I just want to shout out because you mentioned one of the OGs, Tom Zebra. I just had to mention uh, there, there's Laura Shark C. W, there's Acura Amanda, there's Fiona Rawls, and there's Pajama Audits. There's some female cop watchers out there doing it as yes, well. I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. uh, people know that they're out there and you, you can go look them up. But I think, you know, it's just, it's not neat and tidy. You know, you can't put cop watchers into a box. And I think when I think about how the police are a symbol for other issues, it's not just about the cops and that traffic stop or that particular specific act of misconduct. It's about, lar it really speaks to larger social issues and, in and inequities. And that's why cop watching is a sort of organic movement that can confront it in the ways that mainstream media honestly can't. Yeah. And I think that brings us to our guest because I think with him, we can see this idea fleshed out in some really concrete ways. So I'm gonna do an introduction for him. His name is Liberty Freak, also known as Abity. He, along with fellow cop watcher Eric Brandt and ghostwriter, were filming a routine cop uh, car stop by Lakeland Police several years ago that honestly was unremarkable, except for one thing. As they were filming from a respectful distance, another officer pulled up and tried to stop them. So let's roll the clip, Jocelyn, who's behind the scenes. If you can roll clip one and see what happened. Here is Lieutenant Yahia. Uh, coming towards our brave cop watchers. Swim at me again, huh? Do it again, motherfucker. Come at me with a deadly weapon, I'll fuck you up. Get out of his way. Why did he get out of his way? He can get through there, just Are fine. running at me at a high speed. What the fuck is wrong with you, pig? Zero nine. Lakewood police, hot hit bitch right there. What's your name, fucker? Y-E-H-I-A. Better check your attitude, Roy, man. Hey, boy, huh? Check yourself. You better control his attitude. You gotta put a leash on. Okay, so that... Okay. 
so Stephen, um, that was Abity and that oh, gives that was, you. That was, that was oh, I, oh, I'm sorry. That was Eric Brandt. I apologize. That was, that was... when Eric just, you know, as you said, <laughs> this is live and everything. That was when very Eric, live. When the when the officer doubled down and actually drove his car at Eric. After that, let's run the other clip so we can see the first encounter when Officer Yehida blocks um, Abadie. Let's watch that. So okay. run the first, Excellent. The other clip. No, we got Lambo truck. Can I help you? No. All right. I need your help. You got a fucking <laughs> problem, you fucking asshole. goon. Get the fuck out of my fucking line, man. What's wrong with you? Clown. Are right, you a clown? There's always gotta be one oh, fucking oh, clown that shows up. Fucking jackass. You know, you know, you're always the jackass oh, that makes the video. You, you're the fucktard that makes the video every fucking time. Can you just turn your light a little bit away from those folks over there, please? Yeah, now, no, now, no, now, now with this fuck here? face over here, this fucking dick talk. Okay. okay, so I was just sending a little message to make sure that our guest is actually going to be here in just a few moments. So yeah. let me just talk to you a little bit about what happened. So what we see here, we see this car stop. We see that we saw earlier as a car actually came towards Eric Brandt. And right. what's amazing to me is that after interfering with their rights to record, that officer gets into his car and drives at them. And all this probably would have disappeared if not if Liberty Freak, guided by Eric, if they hadn't filed a lawsuit, and this was a pro se lawsuit he did, suing this officer for violating his First Amendment right record. And that lawsuit was later joined by the Cato Institute and the U.S. Department of Justice. And Abadie will be able to tell you about some of the other lawyers yeah. that came in once he successfully filed this initial lawsuit. Yeah. Now, at the first district court in Colorado, they ruled that the officer had qualified immunity because the right to record was not an established right. Now, actually, in Colorado in 2016, they affirmed this right in the state legislature. But as we all know, qualified immunity was sort of um, a carve out from a federal statute known as 1983, which right. basically gives American citizens the right to sue public officials who have violated their rights. But over time, the courts created this exemption, qualified immunity, which basically means that if the right in question was not previously established, then the official was immune from being held liable. So that means there had to be an exact precedent set of a case almost exactly like yours. Otherwise, the officer could claim qualified immunity or essentially ignorance of the law. Now, Stephen, we have talked about what a weird precedent this is. Yeah. Can you talk about how this evolved? Because the history, I think, is actually fascinating. Well, it's really it's really amazing that the, the statute 1983 was actually um, you know passed by Congress during the Reconstruction era because um, right. in the South, African-American citizens' rights were being violated and Congress wanted to give people an instrument to hold public officials accountable and say, you know, hey, they're violating my constitutional rights. I have a right to sue them, sue them to actually enforce my rights. And and so, you know, sounds like a good idea, right? A good way to hold government accountable. If they're violating your constitutional rights, you have the right to sue. So, you know, you have standing. And and but but what happened was the judges started creating this thing called qualified immunity, which is basically like if it's not an established right, meaning if the person or the person that you're suing was not aware at the time that it was established right, then, you know, they have immunity from a lawsuit. It was a way to sort of give people a, a sort of a get out of jail free card. Like I'm ignorant of the law. So if I'm ignorant of the law, then I can't be accused of violating the law, which, of course, as we all know, does not apply to any of us because, you know, the old saying ignorance of the law is not an excuse or a defense. Excuse me. So this has evolved, it kept evolving, and, and after a while it became sort of absurd, especially when you consider that in 2019 when this encounter happened between Liberty Freak and um, Officer Yehida, that their argument of Yehida's lawyers was he did not, he could not be reasonably aware that the right to record, that interfering with the right to Liberty Freak and Eric's right to record was violating their constitutional rights. I mean, that seems absurd, right? But that's what they argued, and that's what the issue that was before the court. And I think we have, I think we see the man is here. I see him. Can we get him in to the? Uh... <laughs> hey there, Liberty Freak. Can you please come in and join our streamyard? Is he here? I think yeah. we see him. Is the man wow, there you are. Yeah. Of Hi. <laughs> How you doing? I'm sorry. I you guys, I had to do a little arm twisting behind the scenes me? to get the man on camera. Yeah, oh, you sound, you sound perfect. You sound perfect, Liberty. So, how so do you first, feel? how do you feel? Yeah, feel... let's just say, how are you? 
<laughs> I would say more than anything, I feel shocked. Um, I can't believe it. I still got to pinch myself about it. Um, pretty excited, though. Uh, I couldn't have done anything, you know, any of this without my friend Eric. Um, he's the one that pretty much taught me what I know so far. And, um, you know, I want to thank God for the victory also. Um, this is, to me, is something that I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to carry on my dad's name. And it was something that mattered. Uh, so that my last name as well as my dad's name uh, would go forward in history. And uh, I was able to do it. Mm. You know, I wanted to ask you a question um, about, you know, filing a lawsuit by yourself pro se. What made, what prompted you? Why did you think this case would be important? And what gave you the idea that you had any chance of winning it? Um, and, and just talk about that process a little bit. Well, um, it wasn't my first case that I had dismissed due to the same reason. Um, I had a case uh, against uh, the Morgan County Sheriff, Sheriff James Crone. Um, and it was dismissed due to the fact that there was no established right to uh, record police. And um, so I, if it was just me, I know there's other people that are suing for the same reason and they're getting thrown out as well. So I figured that it had enough to be able to go forward and by the attorney they called me um, and I saw that there was going to be more, there, there was legal precedence in this case. So I just took it all the way forward, took down, to, took, uh, I, I uh, turned away some settlements and, um, and we went forward and we won. Thanks to great people, great writers, people who know the law for real. So, you know, Abadie, I wanted to ask you, um, what initially happened? Like, how did the judge rule at the circuit level? Like, when exactly did qualified immunity become an issue? Because I think from what I saw in reading your case, that Officer Yahia actually tried to um, act as if he had no knowledge of the First Amendment and that he didn't realize that driving a car at someone was a problem. I mean, that's what I got from reading the transcripts. <laughs> what, what, what did you see there? When did qualified immunity come into play? Well, what it really was was the fact that what it really was was the fact that he was so arrogant about it, right? Mm. Like he bragged about it. He uh, he confessed to it at Eric's trial. Um, he kept going forward with it, laughing, saying, "You know," and I was successful, and that's exactly what I was trying to do, you know. And I was going to put an end to these guys, um, kind of thing. Not, you know, I wasn't quoted, but um, it was just something that really bothered me right so i was like not only is it not answered but they're thinking about it so that's what really took me that little bit further you know they go no this is going to change and this is the time is ripe um there was a lot of activism at the time uh there was everything going on that had to do with free speech and i felt very confident in the lawsuit um i think i brought not only other case law in there from other jurisdictions but also the state law, and um, and w and I felt that with his bragging, his braggadocious uh, thing, which didn't even come into play in the end, um, I figured it had a lot of weight. So I said I should go forward. I wasn't just going to lay down on this one. Um, you know, I just wanted to ask one more question. I'm sh I know you have plenty of questions, Stephen, but I just no, wanted to to say that I saw that in your suit that you were joined by a lot of heavy hitters. I think the Electronic Freedom Frontier was one of them. The Department of Justice came in. The Cato Institute came in. So when did you start getting that outs outside help? And why do you think they wrote these amicus briefs on behalf of your case? Why do you think that they were essentially inspired by your case and wanted to weigh in? I'm, I'm completely humbled by that fact. I mean, I really I have no words for that, right? The, the astonishment to me was like, wow, when my attorney come, you know, contacted me and told me, these folks are writing an amicus, these folks wrote this amicus, and then he just kept sending them to me as they came in. And then finally, at the last second, we got one that said, Department of Justice of the United States of America. And wow, I was floored by that. And um, so... We were, my, my attorney was wonderful. Um, he would call me, we'd get excited about it. 
uh, was just like the most decent guy I've ever had as far as uh, he, he was just, they're, they're absolute pros. Arnold and Porter, they were just absolute pros. And, uh, you know, and uh, he kept me at touch in touch with everything that was going on uh, as soon as it would come in. And, you know, when I saw those things, I was just humbled. I didn't know what to say. Um, I, I could I, I don't know why I was, I got so lucky with that. Hmm. You know, um, I wanted to ask a question because um, I read through the, um, I read through the opinion and of course, you know, they affirmed the right to record, which is wonderful. Um, they remanded the case back. So does that mean the lawsuit is still ongoing? I mean, from what I could interpret, it seemed like they said, okay, well, qualified immunity doesn't qualify here, guys. So you better take this case back and, is it going to proceed? Did I read that correctly or is that incorrect? Um, yeah, it goes forward from here. Um, luckily, uh, they said they didn't have qualified immunity at that time and that uh, this can go forward. Uh, so they, I don't know, I can't remember what you call it, but they, you know, they, they reversed the verdict. Right. Of, of, you know, the dismissal or whatever. So, so See, how... It was funny because my uh, one of my attorneys, uh, Mr. Harris, he uh, was excited to let me know that I won. And then when he brought it to me, uh, he brought me the wrong one. So I kept reading it on the screen. I was going, why would I don't understand here? And then and then he came back the next day and was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and he brought me the actual one and we sat and read it together. And it was really exciting. Uh see that I had one because, you know, where I was at, I could, I didn't have any real access. I didn't find out until the deputy came up to me and said, hey, man, did you know that you made the front page? And I'm like, no way. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, and I, to tell you, I don't know if you noticed, but we're getting a lot of um, comments about our analogy between punk music and yeah, I thought that was so great. I was I was so excited. You guys, if you see my eyes start like this, it's because I'm yeah, trying yeah. to check into the comments as well, and I'm trying to hey. throw some of them up there. Oh, these are some great comments. You know, I saw a question from Michael Willis that I had to ask while we have Abity here. He mentioned, I'm try I won't, I don't know if I'll be able to get the exact wording, but he said, which styles of cop watching are the most effective? most respected and most true to the journalistic ethos and i feel like Ooh. that's a great question Ooh, so abby a, i no, we need i know and it's a tough one too because you don't yeah. you don't necessarily yeah. want to let's you say uh, throw shade no. on anyone else's style of cop watching but at the same time no. i know as a journalist there are certain styles of cop watching that appeal to me personally but abby right. what do you think is the most effective form of cop watching let me throw it at you i i believe the the uh, the effective way is the intelligent way, uh, you know, to be kind, to be polite, you know, you say what you need to say, uh, if need be. Uh, but, uh, you know, the further that we can get this, uh, this knowledge, you know, uh, the, 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 the more that we can strengthen this right, the further we, that we can get it, the better it is. So whatever, okay. whatever technique it takes to be able to do that is what I'm for. But you know it's interesting that you say that because I've watched I was as I was watching the video when that guy stepped in front of you, you guys were like f bombing, and yeah, the very, yeah. You're, you're like whenever you meet if anyone ever meets Apple in person, he's like the sweetest guy, very mild man. Oh but my then, gosh, yes. But but when you hear his videos, you're like whoa whoa. So yeah, it's, you gotta, it's a little it's a little intense. You kind of bring the heat. Yeah, you gotta. It's a, yeah. I'll ask you about that. Like, what happens to you out there? Do you suddenly transform? I mean. You were, you're pretty it's, aggressive. You were saying some stuff that would I would never have been able to say. And, and, I'm, and I, I can't lie. You know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's more of a persona, uh, I guess. Uh, I would do it more as a, actually, what I perceive as a type of safety, believe it or not, right? Um, because a lot of times when you talk to them that way, they just they they kind of get shocked they don't know how to come back to it right mm -hmm. um and uh that's how i felt then and i was a little angry <laughs> you know uh a lot of people getting hurt for the last couple of years you know as we watch it and videotape it and and seeing lives being changed and and you know getting people getting slapped with felonies you know what i mean that, that's done on purpose to 
to ruin their life. Look, some people did, might deserve them, you know, but not the people that I know that have been slapped with felonies, right? Um, they've all been for speech uh, somehow to try to twist and manipulate the law, um, you know, making ordinances very, very vague and, uh, you know, and, you know, this is just, it becomes but it's just a big machine uh, to, I mean, to be able to feed the machine of the jails, you know, they're just constantly throwing people in jail for the silliest reasons. Um, and especially if you speak up to them, if you speak up to them, they're just going to, they're going to try to constantly silence you. No matter how many times they fight this question, they'll fight it over and over and over again, but they will try to silence you. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, for you to file a lawsuit, I mean, the police department, the, the government pays for the police defense. So they'll they'll run it. In fact, it actually is it advantageous to the politicians because they can hire outside law firms who then donate money to them. So it's this beautiful cycle where they can run you into the ground legally while, you know, it was great that people came to your aid because, you know, basically police have this entire like in our city in Baltimore. We spend all this money on outside law firms settlements you know defending constantly defending the police we should be punishing them for bad behavior it makes utterly no sense if you and i in a job or we did something that was irresponsible we would pay the consequences well like in your case i'm sure that officer hasn't spent a dime on his legal defense i'm sure it all came out of our pocket our pocket you know so um it, it's it's interesting but uh but you know i mean now that you're in this position, I mean, are you going to push for a settlement with the city or are you going to go? Do you want to go to trial? What do you want to see happen in your case? Um, I'm loving what, you know, it's for the, you know, the win. Uh, but the reason why I love it is because now others like, for example, Oklahoma was trying to pass some kind of ordinance where you can't record police. Um, you know, and you see a lot of these cities nowadays trying to pass ordinances like this. Arizona just passed one where you can't be within eight feet of a police officer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. You know, um, yeah, and the, and you know, it is a constant battle. Um, but that's why I say if we, you know, if you keep pushing it forward, you know, let us be an example that's going to be able to look good in the laws, you know, as far as the court houses and before juries and things like that. That's just what I'm, that's how I'm going to be changing my style. Uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, I want these injustices to actually somehow uh, at least have some type of relief, because I don't think it's ever going to end um, unless there's, uh, unfortunately, unless, you know, there's a civil war or something like that. Uh, you know, these things are just going to continue. And all we have is what I do, which is just stand up a little bit and, uh, you know, and take it into the high courts and stick with it if you really know you have a case to you know, Abby, I have to ask you a question, and I, you might not be able to answer, but I kind of wonder how anyone, especially a cop, would not be on notice that filming the police was a right. I mean, we saw the trial of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. I mean, we have seen video after yeah. video after video of people pulling body camera vid vid uh, footage or people with their cell phones showing the, the brutality that happens in our country. But how would a cop not know that filming the police was a right? Do you think this is willful blindness? Do you think this is part of their education that they're getting in the police academy? How can a cop not know that your First Amendment right, you can film them in a public space while they're performing their duty? What do you think that is? I mean, I have to say the truth that when you know here recently i've been able to speak to a lot of deputies uh, as a matter of fact so uh i've been having a lot of conversations with deputies and uh you know when i told them what i did i was like hey did you hear i made k i made case law uh and then when i told them the reason for it they were like but well, wasn't that already don't you already have a right to do that you know it's like everybody says the same thing i was strong on it i was like how can my cases get dismissed it's, isn't it obvious um, but, you know, they were nitpicking. This is what they needed to be able to uh, make it so. And uh, so we just took that line and inserted it. By the way, we have to acknowledge, Taya, that Friends and Code mm -hmm. is here. Okay. Just... Uh -huh. Hey, Friends and Code. <laughs> Good yeah. to see you. There's so many great people in the chat that, like, I just want to shout out and say hi to. 
And there's so many great comments. I wish I, I, I know I'm like, like two well, minutes behind in all the comments. <laughs> hey, David ask. Boren. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, Monkey83. And I want to take you up on yeah, that idea to do a punk show. I have yeah. not mosh pit in years. I don't even want to admit how many years it's been. I think, <laughs> so I, I think will the take better you up question is, what punk song would best personify cop watching? If anyone wants to make a nomination. Oh, oh, ooh, I mean, I would I, I mean, play guitar sure there's a Jello Biafra Dead Kennedy song, but I would think almost anything by Rage Against the Machine would be like right on. Yeah. Is that really punk though? I'm thinking okay. traditional. Uh, well, actually, okay, you're right. Actually, well, I would say that's sort of like a hybrid. Wouldn't it be like punk and like hip hop? Right. I, get, I would say something by the Dead Kennedys would be like my okay. first guess. Well, we're, we're, we're opening up to but, other. But, but I want to, yeah. we want to know your, <laughs> we want to know your ideas on what would be like the best cop or watch Abity, song. Maybe Abedi can make a nomination. Though you, you, are you, what kind of music do you like, Abedi? Me? Um, yeah. Old school rock. Usually. Old school rock. So this would, see, even though I know a lot of them, you know, I'll kind of start. What I mostly listen to is like things like ACDC and things like that. Okay. Well, I mean, of the new band, of the new bands are like Tool. Oh, the new oh, bands. You know what? Oh, Tool. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I, I've I've heard, I've actually listened to them. Let me let me ask you a question that I would love to know the answer to. And if anyone in the chat has an answer, please share it with me. Why do you think the mainstream media? is so dismissive of cop watches. Great like, question. what is it that we're seeing that they're not? I mean, because we're we're both trained journalists, but what are we seeing that the mainstream media isn't? That's a great question. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I mean, it's a, um, Abby, what do you think? What do you think, Abby? Why I, don't the MS cover cop watchers? Well, I think it's because uh, law enforcement and mainstream media have a lot of money intertwined with each other. Um, it's always, you know, their narrative is to back the blue no matter what. Um, very rarely do they mess up. The stories are the stories are short, so uh, you know they don't like to bring a lot of uh, transparency to their mistakes. Um, that's just how that's just how the blue line is. Um, hide everything that's true and ugly, and you know, and then make everything else you know sugar coated. Well, you know, one thing um, one of our viewers, Michael Willis, said, which I thought was very interesting early on, he said, bear in mind that initially hip hop and punk were not, you know, were scorned by the mainstream media, too. And we're, you know, we can remember even as early as the 90s with all the political movement against hip hop and NWA and things like that when they said, fuck the police. So really, you know, it's not unusual for an organic movement that is chaotic and creative and confrontational to be, you know, maligned by the powers that be because it's challenging the underlying power structure, right? I mean, in a way, I cop watching, yeah, I mean, cop watching is challenging. Journalists, we like to think we have this power. Of course, Tay and I don't feel that way, but a lot <laughs> of journalists, you know, even because look, I've worked in local, I've worked kind of in every phase of it, even local journalists get full of themselves. And we like to think we have this power and then these guys are coming along with cameras and they're the ones who are actually changing the law like Abity and Eric and, and all the people we talked about. And so it's like, whoa, wait a second. You know, the only way we can fight back with our power is to delegitimize an organic movement, which is well, a lot I, more than we are. Hmm, go ahead. Well, I think, that, I think that they're a little touchy about the fact that a lot of case law has said that, you know, the average Joe with the camera is just as much a journalist as, you know, right. anybody in the big names, right? So they're like, mm -hmm. you know, how dare they reduce us to their level you know um and if you try to say something about it next to one of them they just freak out that's a really good point that's a really, so, <laughs> really good point. you know we like to have our press passes and our badges and you know like True. i mean yeah. you know, ab absolutely because the first amendment doesn't say anything about who's press or who gets to be called press or whatever right. and i think it's um i think it's a really good point we like to kind of maintain our well i'm a journalist and you're not and uh i right. i fallen prey to that myself many times you know that and 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 i do think i do think in defense of journalism there is a process there and there is you know a, a, a way it should be done in certain ways but the thing is cop watching challenges that and that's a good thing because there should we don't need complacency in journalism at this point in, in yeah, all right. things we need to be creative and cop watching challenges our complacency and that's good that's why i love you oh, guys you i mean you you guys oh. bring it oh, i'm sorry go ahead 
No, go no, ahead. I want to hear you say what you love. No, I want to hear what you're going to say. I, <laughs> I wanted to say that you know I want to thank you guys because you guys go out there and say the you know the way that it is, and uh, that's beautiful. We said all journalists would do, uh, but it's like all they want to do is just parrot, just parrot the same stories, you know, the same agendas, and um, you know, just power to all the people who are out there trying to do it. You guys are fantastic. Oh, thank Thanks. you. Thank you, you Liberty really. Freak. That's very kind of you. I appreciate um, it. You know, I actually, I was, um, I had asked for a bunch of questions on community posts and I had saved some of them and I was going through them and I have them and I'll be sharing some more of them a little bit later. But there was a question from a viewer that I thought you could help us answer. And it was from sure. a viewer named Mauricio Rano. And he asked, how can a regular Joe get involved in police reform? How do you get started? And I thought, you know, I think you probably have some good ideas on how just, you know, a person without any sort of, you know, they haven't gone to law school, they haven't gone to J school, uh, you know, they didn't take poli sci. Like, how do you get involved in police reform? You're just a regular Joe going about your business. Well, what I did was I began to get involved. And this was taught to me by Eric, right? Um, get involved with the city council meetings. Um, see what they're talking about, you know, uh, pay attention to your local news um, and the stories that come up. Uh, if you see that there's something that's, you know, that they're lying about or whatever, bring it up. Don't be afraid to voice what you think should be right uh, before your city council and everyone else. Um, you know, stand up for what you believe in. Uh, you know, don't answer the door if they're knocking on it. Uh, pull out your cameras at all times. Record everything everything that you do uh in the sense that uh if you're in front of any government body whatsoever record it it's okay be nice and polite you know and you know what i have another question from nate man and i think maybe we can answer this in sort of a broad way and it's the his question is what is the quintessential state document to quote for the protection of rights against overzealous police on the street? And I would say, of course, that every state has its own bill of rights. And of course, every city has its own ordinances. So you definitely want to know the particulars of your state. But Abity, if you're, if you're confronted by a police officer, an overzealous officer, what would you suggest someone say to them to let the, to let the officer know that you're aware of your rights and that you want to find out if you're free to leave. What would you suggest? Um, my greatest suggestion is don't answer any questions. By the way, I'm not a lawyer or anything, but, you know, don't answer any questions at all. Be nice and uh, mm -hmm. normally try, uh, just don't talk to them. You know, mm -hmm. don't talk to them. At that time, uh, there's no magic words that are going to help you at that moment. Um you know, you want to learn whatever is important in your uh, circuit or whatever, and also what's, what's been done in the U.S. Supreme Court. But even though right there on the front line with a police officer, there's just no magic words you're going to say that are going to change that personality. Um, you know, that, that battle goes up and in through the courts. Like right now I have one trial left, and it's almost four years old now. What's that trial for? It is uh, for being in uh, for protesting the police, the mayor, um, and the treatment of the homeless, and also the you know the, the right to free speech in front of uh, the Union Station here in Denver. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah with my co-defendant yeah. uh, Kyle, and right. uh, he was he was my videographer at the time. Um, we both went to jail, and now we are both co-plaintiffs in a lawsuit against the city on it. Yeah. yeah there's well, some technicalities there, but we might we we don't want to give it away, but we have some interesting reporting on that coming in. The, yes. In weeks. Yes, we have a special up. PAR coming up that uh that Kyle is that. part of and David Boren is gonna be part of. So oh, we have something nice. for everyone to look forward to. We have some... we did spend some time in Denver. We did. Yes, we did. Oh nice. Yes, we did. Nice. Cameras out. <laughs> Right. Yeah, that was that was a very weird because we actually went to the train station where that occurred and looked pretty public to me. Uh, you know, if there's any sort of, you know, it's interesting that people don't understand that um, you know, pretty much the entire right to record comes from the concept of public property, you know, public space. And if 
government officials encroach on public space, uh, it's a fight. Like, even as a traditional journalist, I constantly was in battle with cops about, you know, I'd be on the sidewalk and someone would come up to me and say, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm exercising my First Amendment right, jerk. I, I was actually like a little like a cop watcher when I worked for, the, for a television station because I realized if they took away the freaking sidewalk from me, there was no way I could do my freaking job. I mean, because, you know, most property is private. So if they take away the sidewalk or a train station or places that are clearly public, uh, you're screwed as a journalist. Your journalism is screwed because you just, well, video journalism, you, you, you wouldn't be able to do anything. And, um, and I think your case underlines that issue because you were arrested at a, at a train station for holding a, pro, a protest, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a very scary concept. Um, it is. It's being challenged on its face um, for everything that, no matter what we put in there, the city will dismiss it. Uh, they give us no opportunity to be able to defend ourselves. In my last trial, you're not allowed to mention, and I'm sure it's going to be the same with this one, you, you can't mention the First Amendment, you can't mention the Constitution, you can't mention uh, anything that has to do with the Colorado Constitution, nothing. Free speech. You're not allowed to use it in your defense. Think about that. In a textbook protest from a known protester within this city. And I'm not allowed to use any of the main defenses in a, you know, in a municipal court in the city of Denver. That's how they fight the First Amendment here. They hate it. They hate They well, hate the First Amendment. No. Oh, go ahead, Taya. Sorry. No. Uh, well, I was going to say, we have to keep an eye on our time because, A, that we would answer questions like directly from the live chat as well as the people sure. who posted on our community post. Abity, I don't want you to leave, but uh, we're gonna answer some some questions and there may be one or two questions that I think you should weigh in on. I just want, I saw Blibbits in there. Hi Blibbits. Oh, and also for my Patreons, my wonderful, wonderful patrons, Blibbits, you're one of them. Um, I'm gonna thank each and every one of you personally at the end. So please make sure to stick around to hear me shout out your name as well as my appreciation and thanks for your support because it's not just financial support, it is emotional support because we need it to keep doing this work. And it actually brings me to a community post I received that um, I have to admit was almost a, a little disturbing, but it made me think, and that is why I wanted to, to bring it up and answer it. And I'm just going to find it for you right here. It, I have to, so this was the first one I saw and, you know, they mentioned, I don't know how you do this without some kind of mental breakdown. I have to stop watching these videos from time to time because the cops make me so angry, but someone has to expose them. But one a question that I got here, and like I said, I found it just um, a little disturbing, but I thought it deserved a response. So Van Braxton wrote me this. He said, I still can't understand your tone when you show these murders. You should have a pissed off vibe in your reporting. But as most of the public has become insensitive to them, and then they write a little bit more, that the public has become insensitive. So, oh, well essentially. I guess it's going to keep continuing. And so I just wanted to respond to that because it, when I report the facts as, as I receive them, and I do appreciate getting this comment, if I report it in a straightforward manner, it's not because I don't have feelings about the video I watched. You would be surprised how many times I have to re-watch a video of someone being murdered, someone being killed, someone being suffocated, someone being tasered, someone being brutalized. I don't only have to watch the video, but then I also have to often look at an autopsy report and autopsy photos. And then after that, very often, I actually have to speak to a grieving relative or grieving parent. And if you think that that doesn't emotionally affect me, you would be horribly mistaken. But the reason why I try not to show emotion in my reports is because I have to be considered objective. I have to hold back my opinion and control my tone. Otherwise, people will consider my reporting biased. They won't trust it. But if I give the information in a straightforward, plain matter, no matter how tragic it is, people will consider it. But if I become emotional or angry, people say I'm not a real reporter or that I'm not objective or that I have an agenda against police. So what I have to do is do my best to stick to the facts and not let my feelings 
get in the way of getting someone else's story out there. It's not about me. It's not about how I feel. It's not about how it makes me feel. It's about making sure that that person's stories gets out there to counter the narrative that the mainstream media and the political establishment and the, the law enforcement <laughs> industrial complex is doing its best to push out there. And I'm, Stephen and I are just, you know, one small voice out there trying to push back against that narrative. So I have to do everything I can, which includes holding back my feelings. And, but I can let you have the emotional response. I may have to hold back how I feel, but I hope that it makes you sad or makes you angry. And that I hope that it spurs you to want to make a change so that this doesn't happen to anyone else so that you petition your congressman, make those phone calls, sign those petitions, show up at those protests, go out and cop watch, whatever way that you can make a change in the world so that it doesn't happen to anyone else. So I just wanted to say that um, to Van Braxton and that I hope that it helps you understand why I can't show my personal feelings when I report, because it's not about how I feel. It's about me doing my best to get someone else's story out there and I can't let how I feel get in the way of that. So I just want to respond to that comment. Like I said, I read your community posts. I read your comments on my YouTube videos. I may not always get to respond to them, but please believe me when I say that I do read them. So let me go into the banners here. Whew, got a little emotional there. Um, let me go into uh, some of the other uh, community posts I have. Um, I thought this was an interesting uh, post someone wrote. They said, nope, and this was room with a point of view. They wrote, no people, culture, nation, country, or empire has ever survived. Do as I say, not as I do. Mm. Wow. Uh, that, isn't that powerful? Yeah, that's isn't very that powerful. Yeah. Oof, I hope that I hope uh, that means we can well, correct our course soon. It's, it's sort um, of saying, in in short, no one is above the law. But as we see, but if, but if people law. continue to be above the law, if elites continue to have their way, yeah. So. It, it, Actually, there will be some form of pushback that may eventually over top of the structure itself. Right, right. So that, that is a very interesting, profound statement. And um, I thought so. Yeah, I was really quite uh, impressed with it. So I made a point of including it. Um, so let's see here. This is a question that I've seen variations of. Um, and this is from Jonathan Walker. And they wrote, at what point can we as free citizens defend ourselves from excessive force? Leo versus citizens. And I've seen uh, sort of uh, different variations on this question. And that is a tough question. I actually asked uh, Colorado civil rights attorney, Sarah Schelke, about what can you do to protect yourself when you know your rights are being violated? For example, I was thinking of Harris Elias, who was uh, falsely charged with a DUI. Uh, the officer said he smelled alcohol gave him a breathalyzer, breathalyzer came up triple zeros, still didn't let him go, insisted on a blood test. So he, and they had him in cuffs the entire time, had him waiting for hours. And he, he's, he's actually was, that's how, that's his profession. So not that a DUI arrest is good for anyone, but even a hint of a DUI could absolutely derail his career. So he had to wait for months for the blood test to come back to show that that officer was just fishing. He had not a single substance in his system that could possibly impair him. So, in the, so I said, well, what could he have done to prevent that? Or let's say you're being roughed up by police. What can you do to prevent that? And she said, well, do you want me to tell you the truth? And I was like, well, yes. And she said, well, nothing. There's nothing you can do. There's no, the, what you can do is you can fight back after the arrest. What you can do is fight back using the legal system afterwards. But in that moment, they have all the power. And I said, well, what is there anything that you can do to try to prevent that trip to jail? And she she said, well, there's always the bootlicker defense. And I laughed and I was like, I can't believe you said bootlicker. And she said, well, that's the truth. She said, what's more important to you? Telling the cop what you really think of them or going home? <laughs> and I was like, well, that's a, that's an interesting point. Stephen, yeah, would no, you no, like no, to yeah. address that question? I was going to say that that's one of the things we, I think sometimes the media fails to understand or doesn't really grasp when they're reporting on policing um, because everything is within the scope of what's reasonable from the perspective of the state and not in the individual. And, and some of these acts, like even an arrest, 
can create irrevocable damage, let alone taking someone's life. The power of police is awesome. You know, you either decide momentarily to take your life or your freedom. Um, as, as that man, you know, we covered that you were talking about with Miss Shelke talked about. He's like, you know, he was a pilot. He's like, this is my life. He, he says this moment that really struck me. He goes, this is my life you're talking about. And the cop's like, yeah, whatever. This is just another night for me. This is a, this is a stat that I can book. And, and what's so perverse about policing in America is the divide between how police perceive their jobs, booking stats, you know, making, making their stats for the night, getting enough collars, putting up people in jail, and the absolute destruction it causes on the other side and how it often doesn't relate at all to like crime or violence or any of the things that really, you know, you would want police to address, but rather just generating, you know, activity and generating a process and only creates havoc. And I think it's uh, that it's kind of a terrifying statement you made because police can act irrevocably upon us, right? But we can't um, reciprocate in any way. We can only try later on to redress it in some way that usually isn't going to make it up. I mean, when we talk to parents who've lost their loved ones to police, you know, there's no way to get that back. But but yet we put almost all, you know, the balance in, in police and say it's their reason if they're if they're reasonably afraid or you know if they have probable cause. Um, they can destroy your life. And I think that 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 inherent imbalance that we see <clears throat> is what kind of what cop watching responds to, because that's pure chaos. You know, it, with that, with the, the fact that we constructed a law, just like qualified immunity, we constructed this legal precedence that pretty much put all the power in people who might have been trained for a couple of weeks or who might have, be having a bad day without any balance is sort of demonstrative of how power makes its way through our democracy entirely, right? It can be indiscriminate and it can be destructive. And I think, you know, what you're talking about is, is, is scary and po possibly why cop watching is so can be extreme at times and, you know, can seem overwhelming, but maybe it has to be because we have to bring attention to how crazy this whole system is. Agreed, Stephen. And this is a question. Uh, that's actually another question from Nate, man. Nate, man had, Quite a few questions. I was like, well, you asked like three or four questions. I at least got to put in two. Uh, he asked, um, and I and Abby might even want to weigh in on this one. Which method of recording law enforcement versus the public works best? Live stream or public app? app? And then he also asked, what to do if law enforcement breaks your device or deletes the recorded material? So I wanted to say to Nate Man. Um, while it's not illegal to photograph or record images in public places in almost every state, there are some states that have eavesdropping laws that criminalize recording oral conversations without permission. That's what happened to a young man here in the state of Maryland. He was actually in a government building in uh, Representative Andy Harris's office. He was a marijuana activist. He Facebook lived uh, the the representative's assistant. And this young man who is just 21 years old was charged with felony wiretapping for Facebook live streaming, even though when the people from the office said, please take the Facebook live down, he did immediately. And he was, um, Emmett Davitt, uh, prosecuted him <laughs> for felony wiretapping and nearly destroyed this poor young man's life. So yeah. just check to make sure what, what the laws are in your particular state. That's Maryland. Uh, uh, not a lot of other states, you know, um, don't have a two party uh, consent when it comes to, uh, you know, talking, you know, having a conversation recorded. Um, when arrested, uh, a photographer is also usually charged with disorderly conduct or obstruction or cover, um, or trespass. And although you don't have any obligation to show your images to a law enforcement officer, you might be asked to do so. And I want you to know, you do not have to consent. There are certain conditions called like exigent circumstances where an officer can say they believe your recording might contain evidence of a crime. So they can seize your equipment to prevent it from being lost or destroyed. But it may not be searched or copied without a search warrant or a subpoena. And under no circumstances are they allowed to delete recordings or can you be ordered to do so? But I know this happens. I have seen officers tell people to delete a video or even take the phone from someone and try to make them delete it all that. themselves. So I would say this, because you're asking like, what can I do to protect my phone? I would say it's really good to have like a good pin or password lock on your phone because an officer could use your face or your fingerprint to unlock your phone, right? If you're in cuffs, he can take your thumb, put it on it. Now he's in your phone. I would also say live streaming is a good form of 
protection. So if you know, you, you realize that you're having, a, you know, you're about to have an encounter with a police officer and you can see it's going badly. You know, you can go to YouTube, start live streaming, Facebook, start live streaming. It's a good form of protection because most of these platforms archive the video automatically. And when the stream, when the stream goes off, it's, it's, it's up there. People are seeing it. So I would say live streaming is a good form of protection. And um, Abdi, you know, are you there? Do you have any thoughts on what, what's the best way to handle, you know, if, uh, if you're in a situation and you want to protect your, you know, should you start videoing? Should you start like going to YouTube and live streaming? What, what would you suggest would be the best way to protect your, your video in a situation like that? Um, I, I would also um, recommend having someone with you. Be careful. Don't go out there by yourself. Um, if they do get your stuff, they can change the narrative. Um, also, I've noticed these people with these iPhone watches or whatever, they have a recorder on them. That's pretty good to use also. Uh, anything that they can't get into and uh, can record surreptitiously even, um, that's what you're looking for. Um, uh, oh, I was going to say, is that why you guys go out with like three or four people? To sort of have redundancy or just out of curiosity? Uh, yeah, because uh, then you have somebody recording statically, and then that way they have you have a nice uh, high-definition version of what happened. Um, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes there's some technical mm -hmm. stuff that goes on with the uh, live stream and all that. Uh, right. And also just for your safety, you know, there's just, it's, you know, it's a pretty yeah. dangerous deal if you're, if you're out there um you can get tased, you know, you just, you never know what you're dealing with. They have pretty much uh, some crazy minds out there in a uniform and uh, everything seems to be a problem. They like to escalate the violence and uh, it's a practice thing, you know. A lot of people think it's fun to watch and then you go out there and you get in a situation and it can get ugly with them sometimes. Um, you know, just keep a cool head. Um, some people cross the line too easily, too fast. And uh, this can be a long, un ongoing ordeal if you get hemmed up with the uh, whatever government agency, right? Right. Um, right. You know, next thing you know, you're tied up in the courts and there's ankle monitors and all kinds of things going on. Yeah. So be careful. Out That's there. a good point. You know, uh, the Colorado People's News had uh, left a comment on the post. Hi, Colorado People's News. And this was the comment. Um, I believe it's what states have infringed on the right to record police. And so, I mean, I know many individual police departments have done this, but statewide, I believe Arizona and Oklahoma have new laws to do that. Um, I believe Arizona just passed an eight <clears throat> foot rule so that if yeah. you are filming a police interaction, you have to stay eight feet away. Um, as you can imagine, that could allow a police officer to go, you know, go behind a car or, 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 go, or go behind a wall or go behind a building or duck into an alley and prevent you from being able to properly, you know, record the event. So you can see how that eight foot rule could be, rule could be abused. I, I and also the foresee... Oklahoma, oh, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I just see, I foresee it coming. Uh, they're going to try to, because everybody's seen a cop watch. Police officer always comes right up to your face. Uh, they never talk to you from far away usually, right? So then they're going to use it as, they're going to walk up to you and you're going to be trying to stay eight feet away. So they're just going to keep walking oh. forward. Yep. You know what I mean? Oh, and, that's a um, good point. If you can't yep. back up fast enough, um, then you're going to jail. I can just yeah. see it happening all the time now. Right, right. Wow, I definitely... That's a really good point. I'm so glad you, you brought that up. Um, the only thing I wanted to mention, because they wanted to know what other states, I know um, in Oklahoma that the legislature, um, it, they're trying to pass a bill that will allow judges to block the release of police footage uh, oh. if an officer, uh, if, if it shows an officer getting shot or, or dying. Yeah, and so the judge has, oh, go ahead. They also passed a law, you, you're not allowed to post an image, a threatening image, if, they, if it's perceived as threatening. Of right. A Okay, right. I, I think you were going to get to that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm so glad you. No, I'm so glad yeah. you threw that in. And no. I, I just want to mention that Texas just charged cop watchers Ismael Rincon and HBO oh. Matt with yeah. organized crime, and they were able to do this because I think the initial crime was that they were either interfering or obstructing by recording police. But because there was more than one cop watcher there and they have YouTube channels that are monetized, they managed to give them an organized crime charge. So 
that is something that is highly concerning because as you can imagine, if that succeeds in Texas, not only will it be devastating to their lives personally, but of course other states are going to adopt this as a way to control cop watchers and free speech First Amendment activists. Um, most states have just, out, you know, I was thinking back to the earlier question I think Mauricio Rano had. Uh, most states do have a bill of rights that can be cited during law enforcement, but I think you know, really, it's the Fourteenth Amendment that that you that you you should just take a review of because no state shall make any law that can abridge the privileges or immunity of a citizen. So, to Mauricio Rano, I know you're out there. Take a look at the Fourteenth Amendment because I think that's what you're looking for to help protect you in any encounters with police, as well as make sure you live stream and make sure you have a pin on your phone. I'm sorry, I just I was just thinking about that again because I know a lot of people worry about. Um, interactions with police and they want to protect themselves. And when I spoke to uh, that civil rights attorney, I have to say it was uh, rather bleak, rather bleak uh, how few protections we have from police misconduct and police abuse. Uh, so let me go in here and see if we have any um, questions and comments from our awesome people in the live chat. Unfortunately, we don't have too much time left. I'm trying to go forward to where the new comments are. Uh, we have high friends in code. Let's see here. What can you do when the police don't do anything good for the people who are having dealers and jerks causing problems? We call, but they don't do anything or don't come. That's from Gail Simon. Gail, gosh, I'm, I'm really sorry that you're dealing with that. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a terrible situation. I can honestly say in Baltimore, I have had similar um, experiences and know of other uh, folks in my city have had similar experiences where there are people who actually are committing crimes that are harming one's quality of life and the police don't come around. It you know, really depends on, on the city and the community while that's happening. Uh, in Baltimore City, we actually had about seven officers that were engaging in drug dealing themselves. Uh, they were actually, at, uh, they were known as the Gun Trace Task Force. Now their job was to get guns off the street. They were supposed to get people uh, who were illegally possessing guns and potentially about to cause harm and take their guns away from them. But what they did instead was they would grab someone, plant a gun on them, and then spend the rest of their day uh, kidnapping residents, robbing them, and dealing drugs. So what can you do when you have corrupt officers like that? They're not going to help stop you know, uh, no. a deal or dealing fentanyl in your community if they're actually part of the problem. So yeah. unfortunately, I don't have a happy answer. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes. Um, someone wanted to know an update on El Paso. Uh, the yes, young, that's right. That's uh, right. The, first of all, the mainstream media down there, um, a, a TV station actually did a story about- And they contacted the, us for help with it, by the way. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> and also we learned that the prosecutors have dropped the charges against the family. Um, I can't, we can't take full credit because the timing, we're no. not, <laughs> but the charges have been dropped so that young woman uh, who was facing, you know, some pretty serious charges had their charges have been dropped, which I think is good news. And I know someone had asked about the El Paso family and, you know, I mean, the mainstream media, the a, a television station, pretty big television station out there did a story about the rest. I, I didn't think it was very well put together, but you know, at least they got a little more attention for their story. Um, and then something named El Paso News covered it as well. So there was some local attention to their story and the charges are dropped, which is the really good news for the family. Um, and I hope, you know, everything goes well for them. So we want to update people on that particular story because that was a little. Um, and another thing that we got that we, we should know, we, are, we, we did this story about Christopher Robert Hensley or Christopher Hensley, who died in police custody. And we've been contacted by a doctor who has done some incredible research on prone restraint. And, you know, we're probably going to be doing a podcast with him to talk about it because he said these cases continue to happen across the country. And for those who've missed the show, it was a young man who had gotten into a dispute with his wife. Uh, police showed up and for some reason um, they brought him to the ground, had him on the ground for at least four and a half minutes. Um, and he ended up passing away. And and we had an outside pathologist look at the case. Dr. Sorrell Weck said it was a a textbook example of riot crusher positional asphyxia and the bottom line is that people police across the country still i guess don't know didn't see george floyd or something have seem to have no idea that this is a way to really easily kill somebody and unfortunately but we're going to keep reporting on that because it really needs 
we need to bring attention to that. We need to continue to report on that. And I think Taya and I are dedicated to that. And, um, you know, that, so that's another thing. Um, and then someone is saying that, you know, police organizations go after tear down. Well, listen, I will. Oh, yes. Sorry. Go I ahead. Will, please even answer that. Go I ahead, mean, please. <laughs> but I, I don't know where I could, we can post this on a police accountability report, but I have some great stories about police arresting my editor once, um, which I can't <laughs> on all the details now of me being dragged into a disciplinary hearing for another officer. So the entire police department could yell at me about my reporting. Um, I've got a lot of stories about police coming after me um, personally in a variety of different ways. So that is true. Um, and it's something, you know, that we, we always try to be mindful of. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's actually something that you have to be careful of as, as a journalist. And, um, but I'm glad that there are cop watchers out there fighting to make sure that I can film cops too. And they, they seem to be taking a lot of the heat right now for, you know, a lot more heat than we take as journalists. So someone uh, named, uh, and, and by the way, please forgive me if I mispronounce uh, any of your screen names. Uh, you off says, please answer my question. My name is, I'm not, and I'm, my name is Thomas. My boyfriend name is Ryan. And they gave him PTSD. And you mentioned, I think that you were in mobile um, and that the police department is corrupt um, and that they, uh, that they injured you. Now, I don't know if you can the entirety of you, you, what you can do is you can email us at par at the real news.com. You can, sh if they arrested you during this incident where they harmed you, you can send us the police incident report. We can look into it, see if there is uh, any body camera, camera footage that we can request on your behalf. If there's any dash camera footage that we can request on your behalf. Um, unfortunately, because you were, you were harmed and abused by the officers, um, your only real remedy, um, is to get a civil rights attorney or to get the ACLU to assist you. Um, every state has its own branch of the ACLU. Unfortunately, they are very often swamped with requests, um, but your case is very unique. It sounds to me that you might have been targeted um, because of some of the things that you mentioned in your previous comment. Um, so you might be able to get a civil right, they might be able to recommend a pro bono civil rights attorney to assist you. Uh, to help you essentially uh, have a civil suit against these officers. And also you can file a complaint against these officers. You can file a complaint. My only concern is that if this particular police department that you're dealing with is very corrupt, if you file a complaint, it is possible that they might choose to retaliate in some form or fashion. That is okay. my only concern. Yeah, I want to so I don't out. want to advise you. I'm, I'm not yeah. a lawyer, so I don't want to advise you to file a complaint if that might be the case. If yeah, Taya, Taya, I want to point out that Monkey83 said that there should be an indoor par for me to talk about my police stories. <laughs> I don't have to report from outside anymore. So I think he's making a really good point. Keep forcing me outside is just totally... I need to work inside again. I can't do it anymore. I'm not... Um, you know... I'm, it's hey, just too much for me. Kyle, I'm going to have to give that one a no. <laughs> sorry. <Come on. laughs> I'm sorry. I'm going to have to give that one a no. He can do it from outdoors. Right. But he can maybe, do it from outdoors. Um, you know, wrap up and, and just ask. Right. Maybe get uh, an update from Liberty on the status of Eric's situation. Just yes, I think there are a lot of people who would really appreciate an, an update on Eric Brandt's case. And Eric Brandt is one of the infamous uh, cop watchers, First Amendment activists and activists for the Denver, Colorado homeless community. Uh, so please, if you can, Abadie, if you can give us an update on Eric. Peel that I won, his name was in it. And uh, he uh, he is now, he's been changed uh from prisons, and he's in a comfortable place now, uh, a lot less security. Um, he's like such a model prisoner that his score is like, a lot of people that worked in there are like, wow, is this really a, can you be this score, you know, as a prisoner? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. And uh, so he's doing real well in that sense. Um, he's in as comfortable a place as he can get um, according to his situation. So at least for that, there is a, a breath of fresh air. And his appeal is coming up soon. So it's not an appeal. It's like a appealing the ruling. Um, but uh, that's coming up soon. So let's see what, hap what happens there. That's good. 
That's good. The, okay. I, say, I have seen so many comments about getting me inside and, and giving me a respite from outside, especially in the heat, you know, and I just want to say I'm touched. I am touched that people care that I should have to be outside. All the time. <laughs> you know, but Tay is the boss. We, we have a very kind PAR family and we are very fortunate. I, I am amazed because I have gone down some YouTube rabbit holes and I can tell you the comment section can be ugly. <laughs> it can be fierce. It can yeah. make you lose your faith in humanity. But you guys, you guys actually restore my faith in humanity. And I'm not even exaggerating. As a matter of fact, there was there was actually two people, um, Clinton Hansen and Ryu Lee and Marlon Martinez, who gave me some very nice comments. So nice. I'm not going to post them here because they'll just make me blush and they'll just be awkward. But you guys gave me some very sweet comments. Thank you, Clinton Hansen. Thank you, Ryu Lee. Thank you, Marlon Martinez. Um, so thank you for the sweet comments. But you guys are amazing. You know, like I was saying earlier, watching these videos, uh, talking to grieving families, uh, it's... It can just be so painful. It, it doesn't compare to their pain, but it's it's not easy. But when I see the way you guys respond, when I see that it ignites you, that it makes you angry and that you feel their pain. And I know, first off, that I'm not in this alone. Secondly, that I'm doing this for the right reasons and that hopefully one by one by one, everyone who sees, sees a story, maybe shares it with a friend, um, that eventually there's going to be a consensus because I know our, our audience, it's not all blue, it's not all red, it's not all left, it's not all right. We have a really wonderful mix of people here, but we're able to all agree on one thing, that we need police reform, that there needs to be radical, meaningful change in the way the American public is policed. And if we can agree on that en masse, I really think we can make a positive change. You guys let me know that every week. And that's why I keep coming back. And that's why I keep doing this work. So I just want to thank you all for being the amazing community like you are. I think we have the best group of viewers out of everyone on YouTube. I well, you know, Tay, I can say that as a journalist who's worked in a lot of different places, the passion for, you know, your reporting and what I see is, is really remarkable. And, it, and the people that watch our show and the people that comment are so involved. And so, you know, it, 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 it informed populace is how you, how you create a, a equitable democracy. And, for, right. and if the rest of the world could be as involved as the people in both the cop watching community and the people that watch our kind of journalism, we would have a, we would have a better society in general because the people here really care, like you said, and the people are really involved and they really pay attention and they bring stuff to our attention all the time about different laws and different cases, and different things we should, and we're constantly guided by our viewers. And if the rest of the country behaved as our viewers did in terms of their passion for freedom, constitutional law, uh, you know, better communities, we would have a better, better world to live in. So, um, you know, it's, it's very much appreciated. And, and the conversation is always stimulating and the people we've met have been amazing. So I, I would, I'm just echoing what you said. You said it better and it was beautiful. But I wanted to say you were absolutely right. Oh, you know what? You, you know what? You're getting people to advocate for you to come indoors. No, I know. You did, you did that on purpose. Yes. Oh, and I keep, that was a beautiful wrap up. So I mean, cheeky. I got to. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I'm Aww. with Steve on this one. I mean, that was awesome. And, and you know, and it's true. Yeah. And, and you. going back to what Ms. Teo was saying about uh, talking to the mothers and, you know, yeah. those who have been like, you know, Miss Handley and, uh, Mrs. Poor from Christopher Matthew Poor, uh, Timothy Henley. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it, it does. It takes a toll on you when you hear these stories and you hear a lot of them. That's what you hear in our voices sometimes, you know, um, is that, you know, it's that injustice, right? There's so much of it and all you can do is just talk. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, and, and Taya does the show with such empathy yourself. I mean, Taya, mm -hmm. you're, you're just... And you know you oh, do you have, guys. you do have Come your on. rant you do have your rant at the end of the show where you do, I do get I do get fired up I, do, I try to so for people that's who, where I'm allowed to let out a little bit of the right. of for the emotion a little bit of the feeling Tia isn't showing her emotion she always does it at the end of the show and she does it quite well and so you know you just well, have to watch the whole you. thing yeah you guys we were supposed to keep this to an hour and it we are over 
we once again have gone over because we were having too much fun with everyone in the chat. So as I promised, we are going to wrap this up. And I'm going to say a wonderful thank you to all my Patreons. Hi, Tumblebug. I see you. It's always good to see you. So first, I just want to say thank you to friend of the show, Noli D, for always being there for me and being a support and helping me meet so many wonderful people in the Cop Watcher community. Thank you, Lacey R, for doing an exceptional job as a mod. Noli, you're a great mod, too. And hey. also, I oh, I'm sorry, Stephen, what do you want to hey, say? Joe, Joe Cool just showed up. So, so hey, say Joe Cool. But yeah. I also wanted to thank someone who's hiding behind the scenes, Jocelyn, who yes. helps the PAR come out every week. So thank you, Jocelyn, for being here with us during this live stream. We do appreciate you. Thank you for putting up with our last minute craziness today. We really do appreciate it. So we love you too, Noli. So let me just say that I want to Thank you all for being here to, this evening. And I need to thank my very wonderful patrons. First, a special thank you to my super friends, Shane Bushta and Pineapple Girl. And to my very first patron ever, Jimmy Touchdown. I'll never forget you, Jimmy. Thank you. And I <laughs> want to thank some of my new patrons. Um, and also, just when I do the patron names, I usually do not give the la full last name, just an initial. If you want me to use your full last name, let me know and I will. I just know a lot of people want to keep that privacy. <laughs> so let me say thank you to Kemi, John K, Chris R, XXX, Potshot, Kenneth Ketchum, Stephen B, Blibbits, Cindy King, Dante Small, Sesco S, John M, Pineapple Girl again, Keith Bernard Morgan, Joe Six, The Six Estate A Z, John M, Gary T, Janet K, Rhyme Pantilla, Mark L, Noli <laughs> D. <laughs> I was like, wait, the last name. Okay, I'm sorry. Kyle R, Guy B. Calvin M, Stephen D, Ron F, Alan J, Trey P, Julius Geezer, Omar O, Umish H, John P, Ryan, Lacey R, Rod B, Douglas P, Andreas J O, oh, I'm sorry, Andrea J O, R B M H, Siggy Young, Stephen J, Michael S, Defund. <laughs> Okay, I'm pretty sure this isn't a real last name. Uh, default Urine, <laughs> Celeste, Celeste DS, PT, Just My Two, Talia P, B, Peter J, Sean Best, uh, K Atwater, Joel A, Tim R, Larry L, Ronald H, Tamara A, Artemis LA, John K, uh, TrueTube Live, Kenny G, and my patron followers, Brian McNabb, Felonious Punk, excellent name and is circle of the quantum note also a really awesome name so i just want to thank you all for your support like i mentioned before it's not just financial it's actually emotional knowing that this work matters to you and that you actually value it enough to put your hard earned money on the line it really does mean the world to me and for all of you who watch our show we will do our best to keep earning your respect and your support by helping victims of police misconduct and brutality, and hopefully trying to have the needed conversations about what real police reform looks like, what our country would actually look like if our civil liberties were truly respected. I wanna thank you all for joining us. I wanna thank our guest, Abity, also known as the Liberty Freak for his work to secure our first amendment rights. Thank you, Abity. And thank you, Stephen, for always being there for me to lean on and being a fierce investigator. All right, I'm going outside, I'll see you. Get back out there. <laughs> Be gone. <laughs> As always, my name is Taya Graham. That was Stephen Janice. Thank you for joining us for the Police Accountability Report. And as always, be safe out there. Good night. Thanks again for being there. <laughs>